This presentation will look into how the Norwegian kings from Harald Hairfair to Håkon VI tried to govern Norway. Based on my professional background from business and management, I will try to describe the medieval kingdom in the perspective of modern management theories to provide a manageable picture for the medieval state for us living in the 21st century. Historical sources indicate that the medieval view on leadership and management were quite different from today. Drawing up an organization to explain functions and responsibilities, as I do here, comes primarily from early 19th century theorists. In the Middle Ages, heritage, wealth and relationship to the king was often more important than personal skills. Men, and sometimes women, without the necessary formal positions, could have major influence on state affairs. Also, the content in titles and positions would change according to the king's preferences. Let's start by going back to a time when Norway was only known as Europe's cold northern frontier. In the beginning of the 7th century, Norway consisted of small clan or family-based kingdoms, where the chief was political, military and religious leader, with titles as Earl, Hasse and King. Near the end of the 6th century, the Danish king took control of Viken, the lands surrounding the Oslo fjord. The local chiefs swore alliance to the Danish king to keep their position, a good example of how the medieval kings ruled through local chiefs. Shortly after, the Earl of Hologalan, later called the Earl of Lade, started to unify northern Norway. In southeastern Norway, Halfdan the Black had established a large kingdom around 1850. When he drowned five years later, Harald Herfer inherited his father's kingdom. With the support of his father's brother Guttorm and his uncle on his mother's side, Atle the Earl of Song, Harald started to expand his kingdom. Marching north, massacring all opposition, he at last stood face to face with Håkon the Earl of Lade. The two made an alliance and King Harald married the Earl's daughter. With the Earl's support, Harald started to conquer the west coast. Local chiefs, accepting Harald as their king, kept their position. King Harald often married their daughters. Opponents were brutally destroyed. After the last resistance was crushed at the Battle of Hafsjord, Harald got weakened by marrying the daughter of the Danish monarch. King Harald then ruled Norway together with the chiefs who had supported him. The north went to Harald, the Earl of Lade. Although the saga ranks him next to King Harald, their relationship seems more an equal partnership. Håkon was succeeded by his son Sigurd around 900. His descendants were to be the main contenders to Harald Herfer's successors for the supremacy over Norway until their male line dies out in 1029. Ragnvald, the Earl of Møre, controlled the northwestern Norway, the Orkneys and the Shetlands. He was probably more of a rival to King Harald than the friend the saga portrays him to be. The Earls of Møre vanished from history with his son, while the Earls of the Orkneys lived on through the Middle Ages. King Harald's uncle Atle kept song until his death. Southwestern Norway and Viken was ruled by King Harald personally, while Harald's right hand and uncle Guttorm was made Duke of Oplandene, the wealthy farmlands of eastern Norway. After the duke's death, Harald gave petty kingdoms to his numerous sons in south and eastern Norway. King Harald kept a strong hird, an armed household, to enforce his rule. According to the saga, Harald Herfer had planned to leave the kingdom to his sons with his favorite Erik Bloodaxe as supreme king. But this was not to be. After King Erik Blodax had killed or expelled the majority of his brothers and challenged the rest of the nobility, they turned against him. When King Harald's youngest son Håkon returned to Norway with the support of his foster father, King Atelstan of England, and Sigurd, the Earl of Lade, Erik gave up and accepted an earldom of the same King Atelstan. Due to the prosperous time Norway experienced during King Håkon's reign, the people named him Håkon the Good. To get tribute and pass laws, the king had to meet his subjects on numerous local things. The Old Norse name for legal assemblies and local parliament. Probably inspired by his English foster father, King Atelstan, King Håkon established regional parliaments, where elected representatives from the region's nobility and independent peasantry assembled. This made it easier for the king to meet his people and to discuss and amend the laws and collect taxes. 
on the west coast where King Håkon was strongest, he established the Gulating Law District, with support of the Earl of Lade, who probably saw the same benefits in a representative parliament, Frostating Law District was established. This photo shows Frostating's gathering place. In eastern Norway, where the king had a weaker position, it is uncertain how successful the creation of Eidsivating and Borgarting were. A central task was to defend the kingdom. In order to mobilize the population, King Håkon introduced Leidangen. The kingdom was divided in military districts called Skipsreder. Each district had to produce one fully manned and equipped ship. 250 years later in 1277, Leidangen gave the king a potential navy of 270 ships and 10,000 men. The king's main income came from his personal lands. In the 8th century it consisted of an estimated 20 royal estates and 30 to 40 other estates. The king moved between the royal estates so the Hird and the rest of his household could live of the surplus. King Håkon was the first to try to make the Norwegian Christians. He never put power behind his missionary effort which is probably the main reason he partially failed. Why was it so important for these early kings to introduce Christianity? Actually, it was not the religion itself that was important, but how it could be used to strengthen royal power. The Norse religion was local and ethnical, binding the people to their clan or family and their chiefs to religious acts, making the chiefs the link to the gods. In early European Christianity, the kings were the head of the church. Therefore, Christianity transferred the religious power from the local chiefs to the king, building a national religious unity with loyalty to the king. A local literate clergy also became a useful government tool in controlling the kingdom. The two kings following Håkon the Good, Olaf Tryggvason and Sankt Olaf, forced the Norwegian nobility to convert to Christianity and submit to the royal crown, but were both killed in the process. The Battle of Stamford Bridge ended the Viking Age. Olav Kyrre, who ruled from 1066 to 1093, is characterized by historians to be the one who lifted Norway from the Viking Age into the Middle Ages. In his 27-year reign, King Olav Kyrre consolidated and developed the power structure that his predecessors had been building. Barons or landmen, as they were called in Norway until 1277, executed local government on the king's behalf. They were usually recruited from the top of the local nobility. The exception was the unruly eastern Norway. Here the king used a loyal earl controlling the barons. In addition to the barons, the king had a group of senior officials called Ormen running the royal estates. The king also appointed the Lagmen, the leaders of the four regional parliaments. The constable or Stallare in Norwegian was the head of the Hird, with the royal standardbearer as second in command. During the reign of Olav Kyrre, the Hird probably got the structure we see through most of the Middle Ages, with knights called Skutilsvein before 1277, squires called Hidmen until the same year, guests and Kjertesveiner, young nobles training to be squires and knights. The king was still head of the church, though this was no changing. Based on the church's own wishes, King Olav started to give it a more independent role, which would later, in 1153, lead to full separation and the creation of the archbishop in Nidaros. Land was the main source of wealth and power in the Middle Ages. The distribution of land in Norway in the first half of the 12th century shows us the might of the church. Just before the Black Death in 1347, the church owned 40% of the land estate. Independent and free farmers owned 33%, quite much compared with the rest of Europe. The nobility, which now is the same as the Hird members, owned 20%, and the king had personally the last seven. The church was also directly involved as party in the civil wars that raged from 1130 to 1250. Here we see Bishop Nicholas of Oslo, who was both an important military commander and politician. 
King Sverre and the Birkebeiners introduced several governmental improvements during his range from 1177 to 1202. These improvements were consolidated and continued of King Sverre's grandson, King Håkon Håkonsson, after he and the Birkebeiners finally were victorious in the civil war in 1240. From the time of King Håkon's son, Magnus the Lawmender, in the mid-11th century, we have several sources that provide an insight to how the king ruled. The most important are Hidskroa, the law called for Norwegian nobility now organized in the royal Hird, the king's mirror, and the sagas of the Norwegian kings. This is King Magnus the Lawmender. Closest to the king we find the dukes. At this point Norway had only one duke, the king's youngest son Håkon. Next in rank were the earls. King Magnus had no earls in mainland Norway, so we let the earl of the Orkneys represent his rank. Then we have the barons, the king's closest advisors and usually recruited from the kingdom's leading families. Here represented by Bjarkøy, Giske, and Suderheim. There were never more than 12 to 20 barons in Norway. As mentioned, people of the medieval world had a quite different view on life, religion and leadership than us. Nevertheless, I will now attempt to place the information from the Hidskrå and the King's Mirror into a modern organizational model. The dukes and the earls were closest to the king and had their own Hird. The barons had also their own armed retinue. Normally they should muster 40 men, horses and at least one warship for royal service. The barons also filled most of the leading posts within the royal hird. The hird's commander was still the constable, with the royal banner bearer as second in command. Both were normally barons. Then we have the knights, followed by the squires and the guests, who were an elite unit of about 300 men recruited from the independent landowning peasantry. They were an elite branch, also performing police services. They got their name guests because they visited the king's enemies. Kjertesveinene were sons of the nobility aspiring to become squires, knights and barons. The Fehid or bailiff was the king's treasurer. The Drottsete or the Chamberlain who was a knight was responsible for the king's household and therefore the leader of the king's cupbearers and the staff of servants. Although the church and religious matters now sorted under the archbishop, the king had his own independent clergy with chapels on royal estates and castles. As literate, the royal chaplains also functions as the king's chancellery. From this chancellery, a new position emerged. The chancellor got an increasingly more prominent role over time. When we see the finished chart, we must remember that this is information from the mid-11th century, translated into a modern context. Let us now try to see how the king used this organization to rule his kingdom. The Icelands in the west were governed by the Earl of the Orkneys and his barons. The rest of the country, including Iceland, which now lay under Norway, the king ruled through sheriffs, who were recruited from the barons, the knights and the squires. The sheriff's main task was to ensure law and order and collect tax revenues. Normally the sheriff would also be captain of any royal castle or estate in his domain and responsible for the Leidang fleet and all the regional and local parliaments and courts. The king had also representatives in Norway's seven towns titled Galkjær. The king's minor son Håkon got eastern Norway as his touch. During military campaigns and operations, captains were appointed for the operational military units. They were also recruited from the barons, the knights and the squires. When King Magnus dies in 1280 are both his sons minor. The oldest Erik becomes king after his father, but his mother, the widow queen Ingeborg, takes power, along with the Earl Alv Erlingsson and central barons like Odun Hugleikson. Since the barons have their own retinue, they are not in need of guests to enforce the king's will. Therefore no new guests are appointed, so this band of elite warriors slowly starts to vanish. In addition, no constable is appointed, and the royal standard bearer replaces him as commander of the Hird. Another beginning to make himself more visible in the governing of the kingdom is the Archbishop of Nidaros. This protectorate lasts until King Eric's death. A head injury made him probably unable to rule. Since the king dies with no sons in 1299, his brother Duke Håkon becomes king. 
He has apparently been in strong opposition to his brother's protectorate. One of his first acts was to abolish the baronial title. Existing barons kept their title until death, but no new ones would ever be appointed. The exception was his mother's favorite, Odin Hugleikson, who was sent to the gallows. Also, King Håkon V died with no sons. He therefore organized a privy council to rule in the name of his three-year-old grandson till he came of age. For the first time we see the privy council in Norwegian context. Chancellor Ivar Olavsson was appointed to be the council's leader. In addition, the royal standard bearer Paul Eriksson, the Baron Halvtore Jonsson of Suderheim, and other prominent barons, knights and high clergy were members. However, things did not turn out as King Håkon had planned. His daughter Ingeborg took control over the privy council on behalf of her son. King Magnus Eriksson, who due to his hereditary rights also became king of Sweden. In 1323, however, the nobles stroke back, took control over the young king and made Erling Vidkunsson leader of the Norwegian Privy Council and regent for the minor king. When Magnus came of age in 1332, he became ruling king of both Norway and Sweden. The Norwegian nobility disliked the increasing influence of Swedish nobility in the king's affairs. In 1355, they therefore forced King Magnus to make his youngest son, Håkon, Norwegian king, to separate Norway from Sweden. King Håkon, the sixth Magnusson, became the last king ruling the kingdom from Norway in 500 years. When King Håkon died in 1380, his widow, Queen Margaret, was appointed regent for their minor son Olav by the Privy Council, a position she already had obtained in Denmark after her father's death five years earlier. The old Hirt organization is now gone. The Privy Council, under the leadership of the Archbishop, slowly emerged as a central governing body. The death of her son, King Olav IV, in 1387 were probably Queen Margaret's greatest tragedy, but she turned around and placed her nephew Erik of Pomernia on the thrones of Norway, Sweden and Denmark and created the Kalmar Union that she wisely ruled in King Erik's name until her death in 1412. From 1397 to 1536 Norway was first a part of the Kalmar Union and then in a joint kingdom with Denmark. All the time, the Archbishop of Nidaros heads the Norwegian Privy Council, for a king mainly ruling from Copenhagen in Denmark. In 1536, King Christian III, who was a Protestant, nationalized the church and banded Catholicism. In Norway, that resisted the Reformation, the king drove the bishops from the kingdom, confiscated church property and made Norway a part of Denmark as the country should remain until 17th of May 1814, when the Norwegians once again take their destiny in their own hands. Thank you for listening.